Today's COVID update is brought to you by Fultec Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service. And we are back. And if you're joining us right now, we're getting our first conversation for this morning started. And as we mentioned before the break, we are going to be getting an update from uh, the Honorable um, <clears throat> Minister Jose Abelardo May, who is the Minister of Agriculture, Food Security and Enterprise. And uh, Minister May is joining us via Zoom this morning. Uh, good morning, Minister. Good morning, Gavin. Good morning, Maleni. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. And it's a pleasure to have you on our show again. Um, and uh, so um, the Ministry of Agriculture, of course, has been, uh, it, well, there's been a lot going on in the ministry over the past uh, few months. Um, as we start a new year um, in January, what uh, are some of, or, or what, what's one of the most um, exciting uh, projects coming out of the ministry as, as we start 2022? Well, um, 2022 will reveal to everyone, to the nation, that I believe uh, we have become, I think, the, the victims of our own success. Why I say this is because uh, the seasonal crops are now coming into harvest. We have carrots being harvested right now. We have onions and potatoes. These three uh, commodities would be consider seasonal. Uh, the previous year, um, we implemented uh, new policies. We tried to control importation. We controlled to a great extent the contraband, the illegal entry of these uh, seasonal crops. Um, and we managed to boost the confidence of the farmers. So the farmers started to produce more as a result of our policies. They started to produce more. Um, we have a uh, maybe a hundred percent increase in carrot production. Potatoes was planted out initially in large amounts, larger than last year, but we're having a problem with the disease. So we may see a, a, um, a shortfall in potato production. Onions looking very good. We still have, we have an increase over last year. But what is important for us is that as we are commencing the harvest of these commodities, we um, are in the process of setting up uh cold storage facilities for these farmers mm. um we like to thank the the japanese government people of japan and the ambassador and their staff in the lead for being so kind and helpful to us last year when they visited, visited us we explained to them that we could extend our season if we were only able to to, to facilitate the farmers with cold storage um, facilities. They went out to the fields with us, they visited, and they saw that our request was justified. And they came back a couple of weeks after and said, we will provide to you four containers um, and refrigerating equipment. So that right now is being installed at Central Farm. We will uh, deploy them to the districts where it is more, uh, in locations where it is economic to run the cold storages. If we manage to do this well, uh, we can store a substantial amount of the production. The, the four containers, a 40 foot container, which uh, JICA, Japanese organization, gave us, but we are also complementing that with marketing board's own investment in uh, cold storage facilities for the farmers. So I think that we are on a, a very good start for 20. Okay, let's let's take a moment to look at some of the challenges of recent. Um, and and by the way, I do want to say, you know, um, we're happy to see you well. We know you just recovered from COVID nineteen, um, and maybe you can share your experience before we finish off the segment. But Minister, my, um, you know, a few weeks ago, you were looking at a very tumultuous situation in the sugar industry. Um, let's let's talk about where we are today and what is your outlook in the Cane Farmers Association being able to peacefully hammer out an agreement uh, within the time they've agreed upon? Um, but any sugar industry, sugar cane production is you know very close 
to my heart. I being a Kenyan farmer, coming from a farming community, my constituency being 100% rural, um, it does mean a lot to me, to my family, and economically, it means a lot to the country. So it ought to be addressed with, I should say, TLC, tender, loving care. Mm -hmm. It cannot be underestimated. We cannot sweep the problems under the carpet because it will trip us over. You will recall under the previous administration what occurred in the sugar industry. Now, the sugar industry has a lot of players. There are 5,300 kilo farmers divided among four associations. There is one miller. There is the government, the sugar board, the arms of the sugar board. And now recently, there's a new sugar mill in the Cairo district. There is also another association in the Cairo district and a number of farmers, large uh, cane farmers. So it is a complex situation. Now, when you have the sugar industry regulated by a 40-year sugar industry act, that says a lot. When you have a sugar industry being run with a 50-year-old type model, it says a lot. It means that we have to modernize the sugar industry. We have to upgrade the arrangements between the farmers and the miller. I mean, what used to work for us 50 years ago will no longer work for us today. I mean, markets have changed, market trends have changed, uh, the the the, uh, the uh, ease of doing business has changed. Uh, markets have shifted. Preferential markets have disappeared. The costs have increased. Um, climate change is here, contributing to many of the uh, uh, bad things that happened that had happened in the industry. So we have a lot to deal with in the sugar industry. Now, there are some who believe that there is no place for a small kid farmer in Belize. Well, I am of the different view. Many small kid farmers are not only kid farmers. They are teachers. They are the security guard at the store. They are employed by the government as public servants. Some have another job. Many have another job because you cannot depend only on sugar cane. So sugar cane is something that goes more than just a farm, it is it is more than a than a than a, a, a hobby. People have it. Some people have it a hobby. They love being a cane farmer. They like being called a cane farmer. Others depend on this entirely yeah. for source of income and for employment. So a cane farmer is also a cane cotton. A cane farmer is also a truck driver, and a cane farmer is also a loader operator. So it means a lot, and it has to be addressed the right way. Yeah. Now, there are some who believe, and like the multinationals, who believe, oh, they're businessmen. Well, no cane farmer, I believe, is in this hard job because he loves to work hard. Cane farmers are businessmen too. That is how they generate money to feed their family, to pay tuition, to pay the bills and to maintain their fields. So they are businessmen, except that they create at a different level. So everybody has to be treated as a businessman in today's world. Nobody works hard because they love to work hard, for work hard sake. They're in this for the money they can make, for the profit that they can make. Yeah. So I am hopeful. And after so much deliberation, so much argument, so much discussion different into the sugar industries amongst our colleagues in cabinet, amongst the Northern Caucus members, uh, um, uh, um, along with the uh, air representatives in the North, including the position, my good friend, Hugo Pat, who happens to be a cane farmer. Um, after so much discussion, I believe that at the end of this crop, we will have a new agreement. And to have a new agreement means that some compromise has to be made on both sides on both sides the well, farmers have le have a legitimate reason to be requesting certain things and bsi as a business company also has legitimate reasons for saying you know i need to stay alive in this industry 
And if I make certain decisions, I may not be able to survive. So we have to listen to both sides. And at the end of the day, both must be fair to each other. Let me just ask very quickly, you know, the, the government's role in moving forward. I mean, the, the delay uh, almost two weeks ago was over just deciding on a date to formalize the agreement, not the agreement itself. And uh, we've already heard positions from both sides where they seem fairly firm in uh, what they're willing to negotiate at this time. So it's not a great, I mean, if we use that as an example, it's not a great precursor for what's ahead with the agreement. Uh, what's the role of the government in, in mediating um, if it's already understood that they have very different opinions as to what need to be in the agreement? Well, what we have proposed to the cane farmers and to the industry is that the government is prepared to facilitate a negotiator, let's say a broker, that, that knows the industry, understands the industry, uh, is cognizant of the facts occurring within the sugar mill, because a keen farmer is a keen farmer, he's not a sugar miller, he's not a sugar technologist. But we have people who are experts in these areas and can come in and say, listen, I believe that what you are requesting is far, um, is, 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 is uh, exaggeratedly high, it's too much, or I believe that you can do this, you can do that. We are prepared and the government and the Prime Minister has proposed that to, to, to the industry and said we will and we are prepared to do so. Yeah. The government is also prepared to bring in somebody to make a thorough analysis of the sugar industry. You see, there are figures and there are figures, numbers and numbers. So I as the miller will propose to you a certain number and say this is what it's costing me. Now the farmer has no way to verify if that is so. Right? But if we have experts in the area coming and say, look, this is not what it's supposed to be. Something is wrong here. Let's deal with it. Let's deal with it. But we have to be fair. Now, what has happened over the years, Marelli, is that there is a total lack of confidence on both sides. Yeah. Whenever something is proposed by ASR, the farmers view it with skepticism. And when the farmers propose something to ASR, it is also viewed with skepticism. So there's a total lack of of confidence on both sides and this has happened have both it sides has... accepted the the um the offer for mediation for a mediator in principle yes they have no the question is here is who mm. because we throw we throw out a name as much as no no, no uh, i don't i don't want a person yeah. so it is who so as i return to work uh tomorrow um we begin the task of identifying a person Okay. But it's good to know too, um, um, would, it, that, would it be an international representative? I mean, what's what's the thought process here? You know, I mean, I think the word you used is right. There's this skepticism well, it, when yeah. other people get involved. Well, there's two two uh, persons that we plan to, 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 to identify. The first one is could be one that is local mm -hmm. and that can be perceived as being neutral. Mm -hmm. And that understands the industry may not be a sugar technologist but understands the industry right and that person you see could facilitate the process let me tell you what is the worst thing that can happen i as a key farmer write to asr and say listen i am not as stated in the agreement i want to renegotiate the terms and conditions of the of the agreement yes and then bsi takes one month to respond and say I have no interest in negotiating with you. One month. And the farmers write back and say, can we sit down and listen to us in the next couple of days? And they take another three weeks to respond. And they say, give me a rationale. Yeah. And then time is dragging on. And the farmers respond again. And so far, two months has passed and nobody and they have not sat down. Mm. Now, I, in my view, the first person will ensure that this does not occur. Right? Okay. If if ESR has written to be a CFA and said, I want to meet with you on this day, that person will ensure that the correspondences are received and replied to in due time. Mm -hmm. And that, that should be reciprocal, both sides. So we don't accuse and say, oh, um, I want to meet with you, but you don't want to meet with me. Yeah. Or I want to meet with you at my facility at, at 
to a hill and you are saying no i want to be to you at gala lunch and and these are all delayed tactics mm -hmm. on both sides they, we cannot continue to delay the tactics delay the, the process we have to begin and begin now if we are to have an agreement by the end of the crop so and both sides have to understand that so that person will come in and facilitate that yeah. that among other things in my view now we have to develop right now which our, our person that these is working out on the terms of reference for this person now identifying the other person that will come in and do an analysis of the sugar industry there are various people out there with high profile um, um uh resumes uh, that have worked in sugar industries across the world in south africa in australia in florida in guatemala in south america and these people are knowledgeable and experienced so we can look let them look at our industry and say listen this is what you can do to fix the situation so again we are working in terms of reference to that but important note to you right now for you to know Amalene, is that we are at this time about to finish off the sugar industry the, rev the reviewing of the sugar industry act that was mm -hmm. if i if i could yeah. just interject there because that's that's my question actually whether or not the new oh. act will be taken to the house before the sit down for the new agreement because i mean i haven't seen the updated sugar act if you can provide a copy we'd be able to say more about it but if that has implications on what can be agreed upon or how the agreement is made yeah well Marlene, um just on saturday went by um the individual responsible in the ministry of culture to people sugar industry made a presentation of the draft to the members of the the ministers of the north mm. that was our first president i was not there because i had i haven't been on quarantine for some time now uh, but i understand that <clears throat> it was well received there are a few questions and a few uh, uh um a few concerns mm -hmm. And of course, there are suggestions for further improvement. But this again has to be circulated to all the stakeholders. Everybody has to know what's going on. The, it's, if it's one thing we do not want is that when this is completed and passed, someone say, oh, I'm not in agreement. Although we have heard and we have received correspondence um, from stakeholders. I said, listen, I, I, I want nothing to see with, with, uh, with the law. I don't want to be regulated. I want to be free. This is business, and let's operate, and and let's get this ball rolling. Why does government have to intervene? Why do there have to be a law to regulate the sugar industry? No. Even in Mexico, one of the powerful producing countries, even in Guatemala, again one of the largest producers of in the region and the world, it is legislated. Even in the great United States of America, the sugar industry is regulated. In a small country like Belize where you have 5,300 small stakeholders, it must be regulated. Or else, the big fish will eat up the small fish. That is contrary to what we stand for in this government and as a party. We have to regulate to ensure that the small kin farmers are taken care of. We will not leave them out there to any multinational. At the mercy of any multinational, that will not occur. This is not the republics. This is not... Dominican Republic, this is Belize. And we, in this government, we look after all the farmers of this country. Cane farmers, cattle farmers, and all farmers. So regulation is something that has to occur. It will occur in the best interest of the industry and the small producer. What's what's the consultation process like with the farmers associations and, and the two millers? Well, regarding the sugar industry, um, we had written to everybody. Let me explain something to you. Um, there was a draft done in 2010. This draft was commissioned, I think, by Ika at the time. I think Dulat Bodran. He was the consultant who worked on this 2010. For some reason or the other, <clears throat> that draft was shelved for a long amount of years, from 2010 to 2021, now that we came into government. Um, we look at that draft it had many good things in there with recent changes and occurrences within the industry 
we made further adjustments. But we have written to everybody and said, listen, there is a draft out. We want you to look at it and kindly comment on it. What is it that you want to see in the sugar industry? What is it that you want to see improved or what you don't like? Um, the boat millers responded to us, the, uh, Santander responded to us saying that they would like to see A, B, C, D, um, but they don't want this. Um, the associations, I believe, have all uh, responded and don't, I'm not, I'm not sure what was their response, but there was another miller who had said that, you know, I don't want to be regulated. Um, as a matter of fact, the time that you've given me to review this is too short. It's only so many amount of days, so we want an extension. We did extend uh, for a large amount of time, and then the response was that, listen, I don't want to, I don't want to be legislated. I don't want to be uh, uh, regulated. I want to be free. This is a uh, um, business and let the private sector deal with the private sector. Yeah. Um, I we um, we cannot we cannot consider that, of course. Um, but we do appreciate their input in this. So there will be consultation with them. They they will see this sugar industry act. They will see it, and they will have their time to say what is that they want or what not. Um, same with associations. Um, um, so it is so something that is going. Yeah. It is ongoing, and let's see what. Uh, what's up. what's the time frame? When when do you expect um, mm -hmm. the the act to be taken to the house? Estimated. I suspect that it can be done by the end of March. All right, Minister, I do want to move on to some other issues. Uh, while that alone is something that can take up all our time, we know, um, you know, the, the bounce back um, from the economy, I, I, as, we, as I know they're still um, finalizing the figures, uh, two industries have really been able to help. Tourism um, and, and the return of tourists uh, at a faster rate than was expected, and agriculture. Um, my question is, with the reopening of the borders with the resumption of the contraband practice that we know do you think that the growth that we've seen in agriculture is sustainable i hope it would i really hope it would my concern is just that too the level of contraband um and the level of the amount of money that will leave the country to our neighboring countries but we must be real Mm -hmm. We cannot lock down ourselves forever. So what needs to be done is to put measures in place to mitigate the effects of contraband or to reduce um, the illegal entry of goods. When I say illegal, is without paying their, 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 their duties and their taxes. Mm -hmm. That is my concern. Yeah. We have a lot to do. We are right now looking at, from our side, our units that deal with the importation of goods. We have, for example, Baha has the quarantine unit. We have had, we have heard horrible stories that occur. And that many goods are coming to the country without paying their tariffs or their taxes. And I am very disturbed when I hear that Baha, who is under my ministry, quarantine department, is being accused of these things. We've had more than two incidences where we have actually found out that the officers allowed certain things to come in illegally. And that has not gone unseen. It is still on the table for discussion and it's still on the table for us to take measures. But if we, in this government, are serious about importation and taxes and government collecting revenue, these have to be addressed. And I have spoken to my CEO, I've spoken to the managing director of Baha, and we begin to work on that immediately. Now, the biggest revenue generator for is the quarantine department. I am of belief that if we put ourselves to the task and do things correctly, Baha can generate 
more. No, it's not to say. It's not to say that we will bleed the public. But we are governed by Allah and their regulations and that we must charge certain taxes for certain goods. If the officers do collect and do not provide a receipt, that cannot be the order of the day. And that has to be addressed. Now, we have customs, we have supplies control, we have Baha, we have other line departments which can help with this. But if we all do our share, or our fair share, I think we can open the borders and be confident that government will still be collecting the revenue necessary to run the country. And uh, Minister, earlier on in our show, before we started our conversation, uh, Marlene and I were discussing um, the issue of the contention which is currently taking place at the Port of Belize. Now, of course, this could, um, based on how that uh, continues to go, this could, of course, have serious ramifications um, for the exports, uh, which which would be or which would which should be leaving um, the country. Uh, the Belize Chamber of Commerce and Industry did issue a release talking, uh, was seeking, um, you know, for a quick resolution of that uh, of that situation, and they also cited the backlog of containers, um, at least. Um, for incoming um, goods. Um, has there been any effects um, that you have seen within your industry in, in terms of the exports? And um, what is your view of that issue and how, um, you know, from the government's perspective, you, you hope to see a resolution? Well, I don't know if it's fortunately or unfortunately, but it has not affected the export of goods from Belize, agriculture goods. Mm. To be honest, there is very few agriculture goods that are exported, except many manufactured with sugar and a few other goods. So I don't know if that's fortunate or unfortunate. I wish though that we could have our ports filled with containers leaving this country with agriculture goods. It's not the case, sorry to say. If papaya would still be a living industry today, the sector would have been punishing, definitely. Because papaya is a perishable, it cannot stand at the port for one week or one week and a half until a standoff like this is resolved. Mm -hmm. So, and the sugar that's leaving the country now, I believe is going to be creek, um, bulk sugar. I think some Rough. some bag sugar is going through the port, yeah. but again, that's not a perishable. So you can stay the, in the in the in the bag for a month. Of course, you have your commitments over there that you have to sub, you have to supply uh, your 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 consumers or the your customers out there. So, but as far as I know, exports are not being affected from the agriculture sector. I believe the imports are though. Um, the the uh, importation of agrochemicals, inputs, machinery, equipment, um, spare parts, and so on will be affected if this standoff continues. Okay. And if I could just, I mean, that's, that's one issue. I wanted to touch on another one. I believe la the, it was the end of last year um, in the cabinet brief, uh, there was a concern raised about the increased cost of living and your ministry was in fact instructed to look into things uh, that could be affecting that. Um, we know that uh, the, the cost of goods has gone up astronomically for many persons and it's not standardized. Let's talk about what, what your ministry is doing in looking at this issue. We, we haven't heard much from the Belize um, Bureau of Standards or, or what's happening in, in monitoring um, prices across the country. Yeah, actually, uh, Marlene, we did, when that came up, um, we did follow up that exercise. Our um, supplies control unit went out to the city and they did um, random sampling. And that that uh, report was presented to cabinet with a cabinet paper um, saying that 
certain things could have been done. At the same time... So um, there is price gouging? Oh, absolutely there is. But to a great extent, the cost of goods have gone up tremendously. There was one example, for example, corned beef coming out of Brazil. Of Brazil. The one leg of the journey from Brazil to Florida was excessively high and from Miami to Belize was somewhat lower. But when that price arrived in the stores, it was priced at more than 25% profit. I think it was like at 45% profit. So when you combine the cost, the acquisition cost, the transport cost, and the gouging, the corned beef was at a price, I think, that has never been seen before. However, in cabinet, we, after discussing the part of the document, Minister Koi and I were to sit down because he was looking at the bigger picture, at, at, at the input duties and so on, right? And so we had decided that we will sit down and look at combined both cabinet papers to come up with something, um, one cabinet paper to implement. <clears throat> that was just before I, I uh, got infected with COVID mm. and had to stay out of cabinet. This is my second cabinet um, that, I'm, that I'm missing today. But um, we, but we if, need to... If I could just back. get a question in there on, on the same thought though, before you move forward. Uh, what about issues like consumer protection? Because I think that's where there is a rising cost of goods, but people are able to identify where, just as you outline, that the, the profit margin that is added in, in some stores, is, is very different and, and exorbitant compared to others. But what is the level of protection that us, as, as consumers who go in, <coughs> expecting that there's some sort of, of monitoring that is taking place. Marlene, we don't have the we don't have the staff, we don't have the human capacity to do that. But in the in the cabinet paper we had proposed that we let the consumers protect or police these stores. Um we had well in the cabinet paper we had suggested that you walk into a store and you see a price of a good that is elevated above what it's supposed to be, you call a hotline and immediately people go, uh, or our staff goes, look at it and issue tickets. We were discussing about issuing tickets to the shop owners, right? And, and, and tickets and closing down the business until that ticket is paid. And that business would then be also advertised in the newspapers or in the media so that people know that these people are gouging. Now, we believe that by if you do five, six stores in Belize like this, nobody wants a store closed because they're gouging. And everybody would know that they're gouging. So the consumers would not go to those stores to buy because they know that they're gouging. So again, that was all in the content of the cabinet paper, which we will bring back next week in, 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 in cabinet for us to uh, implement. Uh, I will meet um, this week with Minister Koi and the other ministers, and we will make adjustments to that cabinet paper and bring it back for for cabinet's approval. But that has to be done. Um, it is important because price owners, uh, sorry, shop owners are just taking advantage of a situation. We all know that the cost of goods, according to goods, went up. We all know that the cost of transportation went up. But gouging then is something that is not needed. It's not needed. So we can uh, definitely, ha we have to address that matter um, next week. Well, we, we do look forward to, to hearing the result of uh, that presentation at Cabinet and, and see where it goes from there. We are completely out of time, but if you could just tell us very quickly, um, you know, we know that, as you said, you come out of quarantine tomorrow officially. Uh, you did contract COVID-19. Um, anything you'd like to share about your experience or, or warning to others to avoid um, or to continue with their safety practices? Well, one thing I will tell you, um, Marlene, 
thank God for the vaccines. Because I think that if we had not had these vaccines, it would have been a total different story. Um, especially people that are in some way or other compromised um, or have underlying conditions. I, for one, have suffered uh, pneumonia twice. And so my condition um, was very scary because having contracted pneumonia, uh, your lungs never come back to what it was before. And so I was very worried about it. Um, I took no chances. I, I, I took my meds, took my rest, took all the home remedies. The house was smelling like, I don't like what, all <laughs> kind of herbs were being cooked at home for my speedy recovery. Um, I feel very well right now, a little stuffy, a little itchy throat, but I generally I'm feeling very well. And I encourage every single body to, to take the vaccines. We cannot uh, underplay this, this disease. Um, I am told that this new variant is a lot less uh, uh, weaker, that is the correct term, I'm not sure it is, but um, the Delta was much more dangerous. But whatever it is, um, there are people right now intubated in the medical facilities. There are people that are died, have died yesterday, I think. And so um, I don't think that any variant is something to play with. So I encourage every single body to get their vaccine. I'm fully vaccinated with my booster, but I still uh, underwent some scary moments. So, um, and my family, my mom and family con uh, contracted the disease, um, but we all came out of it well. So I thank God for that. Thank God for the vaccines, and I encourage every single body to take their vaccines. It's important. Well, uh, Minister, um, we do want to thank you for coming in this morning and sharing um, all of those updates from the ministry. And of course, um, we are glad to hear that you are um, feeling better and that you'll be returning to work tomorrow. So thank you, uh, Minister. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you, Malini. Have a wonderful day. All right, you too. And with that, we're going to be taking a short break. And when we come back, we'll be talking with Hope Haven and we'll be talking about uh, domestic violence and uh, tips for um, people living in that situation, how to get out and how to survive. So please stay tuned and we'll be right back. This COVID update was brought to you by Foltech Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service.